Welcome to MAP, the bi-weekly market access podcast provided by Mars Market Access and Pricing Strategy, which is your healthcare consultancy in the German-speaking markets. Mars makes it as easy as possible for you to get your pharmaceutical, medtech or digital health product to the market and of course get the price it deserves. My name is Stefan Walzer, I'm the founder of Mars and a health economist by training and working in the fields of market access, reimbursement, pricing and health economics already since 2004. Additionally, I founded the consultancy P&N Pricing and Negotiations in Healthcare based in Toronto, Canada, which supports companies and individuals globally by coaching, simulations and training, especially on negotiations. This service is including our innovative virtual reality simulation program and is part of the Negotiation Lab. And now let's learn about the market access and reimbursement systems around the globe. So welcome again to the next podcast episode of Market Access. Today again with a topic on Amnok. Amnok, maybe we can tell it or say 2.0. It's at least around the reforms which happened especially in 2023. And uh, my guest today is again, happy to have you, Matthias Slume. Yeah, thanks Stefan. Great to be in your famous podcast again after <laughs> I think one or two years again. Yes. Um, yeah, happy to support, maybe to introduce myself quickly for those who do not know my, my background. I'm pharmacist MBA by training and head of a regional physicians association. We provide outpatient medical care for more than 10% of Germany and I'm head of the drug department. That means I'm responsible for the regional contracting with the statutory health insurances, but most important communication management of the prescriptions on the physician side. And yeah, therefore happy to provide perspective on the MNOC changes from a more practical bottom-up view. So not from a federal level, but more from a regional payer implementation level. And yeah, great to discuss and answer your questions. Perfect. Thank you, Matthias, also for the introduction. So um, you said it already. I think there have been quite some changes since January 1st uh, this year. Um, and before we maybe come to the, as you said it, more the practical implications for the physicians, but also for the regional payers you have, you're also representing today, could you summarize very briefly for you, which are the most important changes which have been implemented in January this year? I think that most of the changes are really directly aiming to generate financial savings on a, on, on a short-term perspective. And, and the main focus from my perspective was on products, either with a no additional benefit rating or with a relative low uh, demonstrated clinical improvement versus standard of care. The consequence were um, the guardrails that drugs with a no additional benefit rating have to provide a mandatory discount, minor benefit, price parity versus uh, branded comparator, but also the pressure on the orphan drug area. There we see there was this reduction of the threshold of annual sales from 50 to 30 million euros to be eligible for a full regular benefit assessment. Again, a focus on evidence generation, you can phrase it like this, or a focus on products with high sales volume and limited evidence to force them in a regular benefit assessment with potential price referencing to comparators. And also, at least I think intended as a kind of quick win, the combination discounts, I think that's a longer topic to discuss in terms of implementation, but also really focused on generating um, savings uh, for the constellation of combination use. That would be on a high level my my summary. So we did not really see a change in the methodology of MNOC, definition of patient-relevant endpoints, general framework questions, how do we work with indirect comparisons, do we look for cost effectiveness, all these other general discussion topics were not part of that uh, reforms or update. Um, it was really mostly focused on financial quick wins to my interpretation. 
yeah, I think I, I would agree. I think there have been also a couple of other points and items which have been discussed before the reform was also decided on. I think you mentioned already some of those. So when I speak with some, let's say, responsible market access person in the industry, let's say some people might also say, especially because of the orphan drug threshold decrease from 50 to 30 million, right? Um, and also the pricing guardrails might maybe change the importance of the German market in the, let's say, the global competition between the different countries, maybe, and especially when we see, let's say, more positive signals, for example, out of France. Would you agree on that? Or would you just say, look, I mean, Germany is still important, it will remain important? Um, I would still see Germany as a as a very important market and also as a kind of yeah, leading market also, because um, if you remember my last comments about the implication and focus of the MNOC reform, it's not to keep drugs away from Germany. It is more the focus to pay less for me to drugs or limited evidence. So I would answer from two angles. Uh, first of all, for a drug with a substantial improvement versus standard of care, Germany was and is a very attractive market. You have full reimbursement from day one. If you have a substantial clinical improvement demonstrated, um, you have also usually not major issues in the price negotiation. So this limited free pricing period does not really hurt a company. And um, as I said, you have full reimbursement from day one, have sales, but also experience with the treatment of patients, learn how physicians perceive a new drug and patient. So I think if you are early enough to develop really a robust clinical value story for your product, Germany is still great. You have a problem when, or more problems when you have are more in a kind of me too situation. Then you have more price pressure with this 10% discount versus the branded comparator. Um, but honestly, at the end of the day, I'm not aware of many other countries where you have, with a Me Too setting, uh, great pricing opportunities. Their payers even tend to negotiate harder. So I think the most important takeaway is we did not implement a fourth hurdle in Germany. For products without additional benefit and a cheap comparator, it becomes more challenging. That's true. But... Any product with a with a robust evidence generation is um, has still very good opportunities. Yeah, I, I, I would I would I think agree also with that. I think the other important thing is obviously I think when you compare let's say other countries and their assessment of orphan drugs, I think Germany is still let's say quite unique as well, right? Independent if it's now fifty or thirty million euro of a threshold, I think um, at the end of the day there isn't a, a positive added benefit. For orphan drugs, independent of which kind of evidence is given, yes, we have as well a bit of a staggered now, let's say, decision, but ultimately it's not like we see it in other countries. I think that's also an important point. Exactly. And, and you have practically this 30 million euro until the 30 million euro threshold. You have, um, you can achieve this even at the up to that level. You have at least an unquantifiable additional benefit. The GBA is not allowed to define a clinical comparator, so you have no formal price comparator and are still in quite good position. And I would say if the worst case for a company is 30 million annual sales in Germany, and if we see Germany as whatever, 5 or 10% of the worldwide market, um, that should not be the killer of the business case. Yes, that, that should be true. I agree. I agree. I, I think another important and maybe interesting thing is, I, which was just coming out of, my, out of my mind when you were speaking, we still had the free pricing for at least the first six months in Germany, right? And I mean, what, what we have seen now, and I don't know whether this is just, let's say, good luck or just by chance, but what we currently see is before the change, the negotiation, the price negotiation on a national level would have been basically uh, done after another six months, right? So after 12 months, 
sometimes, yes, of course, it was also a bit longer, even that nobody was calling up the arbitration board. But now I don't, I'm not sure if there's now a, a trend that, let's say, both sides take sometimes also a bit longer because the pressure is, to me at least, a bit gone, right? There's no need now to be ready after 12 months and then just call up the arbitration board because you had the 12 month kind of free pricing because you would, you would as a company, anyway need to pay back from month seven on. Would you agree or is that maybe just something like, you know, kind of dependent on the product potentially? I think that really depends on on, on, on the product because um, also from regional level, we are not tracking each price negotiation so closely that I would feel comfortable. But what I see is we don't hear more complaints from companies. Mm -hmm. And from, from my, let's say, practical perspective, from a, for me, it's, of course, we are not thinking about international reference pricing signals for to other countries. If people ask me, does this reduced period of free pricing have a relevant impact for the company? My answer was always not really, because our experience is that physicians have quite well understood the mechanisms of MNOC and they know if there's a product in a chronic disease with 16 weeks versus placebo where the price will be maximum after one year. Mm -hmm. And if such products really use this free pricing to set a very high price, as I said, there may be international consideration, it's not my business, but from a practical prescriber perspective, physicians usually don't prescribe them relevantly. Mm. We see a quick uptake with high cost drugs, high cost relative, especially to standard of care, practically only where, where there's a clear benefit that the physicians say, I must prescribe it today. Um, like a few years ago, nothing for systemic therapy of was atopic dermatitis for atopic dermatitis patients available. Then the first biologic well tolerated came to market. And you have a patient with a severe disease, um, then then you prescribe it even in month one. Yeah. And yeah. and those those products which really lose money between the initial list free pricing and the benefit assessment are those if they are overpriced, which are not prescribed so much. So that's maybe what I can add from the regional perspective. And therefore um, it has some implications, but for, from my perspective, not too many. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's a good point. And then I think you're already nice, let's say, moving over a bit into the more practical implications, because I mean, you, you let's say, you feel what is happening, let's say, on the ground, right, with the, with the physicians. I mean, I could generally imagine as an economist, right, there, I know that the, let's say, price demand elasticity is not that elastic at the end of the day in healthcare, right? But due to the fact that given all of those items on the reform, the prices should generally be going down or maybe even be, let's say, launched on a bit of a lower level. Do you feel and see anything by physicians in terms of changes, in terms of prescription, prescription behaviors or anything like, do you hear something like that? Until now, no. And that was also when I prepared for our discussion today and thought, oh, what examples can I mention for, for, for Stefan? And also remembering the, of course, huge discussion on the federal level, on the industry level, on conferences. Thinking about the practical implications, my answer is um, they did not really arrive uh, on the on the ground mm -hmm. um, because physicians are price sensitive in Germany. So they look for, for list prices and um, many have developed an idea. I look for, for, for the benefit rating. The benefit rating has not changed because of process um, that results in a benefit rating was not affected by the assessment. Um, often drugs which are now forced into the regular benefit assessment, that's not until now not really visible, transparent. There's also, if you see, there's practically no communication also from the GKVS, VN, sick funds to physicians. You don't see a list. Oh, these five orphan drugs are under renegotiation now, or we started because they exceeded the 50 million, 30 million euros threshold. I don't think that would be 
that that is confidential, but um, it's not it's not transparent. It's not communicated, so the physicians don't see it, don't feel it. Um, also, the payback for another six months is something physicians don't see in their prescription database. And in case of an economic audit, how this money arrives at the physician is also not clear or transparent. So for a physician, not really something different. And I've also not seen any structured information to physicians or, or let's say on a regional payer level and subsequently to physicians, for example, on renegotiations and price reduction because of the rule that you have to, with no additional benefit, you have to price minimum 10%, nothing. And and therefore, my point is that, that it did not, these guardrails and MNOC reforms do not really arrive at the physician's office when the physician sits in front of his computer, looks at products and prices and and um, and does a decision and when we maybe also later on touch on combinations discounts um that's similar In, interesting i mean I, I think especially i mean that would have been also one of my other questions especially maybe the the application within the economic audits right i mean if i would be a physician and i would get into such an audit i mean i would at least want to have those let's say kind of further discounts being somewhere applied because sometimes they are let's say significant, right? Maybe that might have even changed the picture, right? I'm, I don't know. But I mean, as you said, there are no rules yet, right? Yes, that can be very significant. And you could also ask uh, with a combination discounts that a physician who is uh, using an, for heart failure an SGLT mono has almost the same economic burden than a physician uh, using an SGLT mono, mono plus an entresto <laughs> in parallel, at least in theory. But the question is how it's not transparent when the combination discount applies in real life, so results in a financial flow. That's not transparent. And today it's almost first, no, it's 29th of August, but when the audience is listening listening to our podcast, uh, two third of the year has have, have been gone, I'm sure. Yeah. And uh, it's not clear when it applies, how much it how much it is, okay, roughly. And it's also not clear again how it arrives in the budget of the physician in case of an of an economic audit. No <laughs> idea. And it's just um, trust, hope that it arrives somewhere and uh, this is i think another example that um things are not really structured from from top to to, to the bottom um to those who sit on the ground and uh, treat the patients and have also the economic responsibility yeah, no, no. I, th I think it's a very good point as well. I think, um, I mean, my, my perspective on combination therapy was always, I think that was especially introduced, obviously, for those kind of, especially maybe in the future, high cost combination therapies. I was more coming from the oncology area, right? I mean, if you combine two of those really high cost kind of product, I mean, you could end up, uh, let's say, on, on really high numbers. So that was my interpretation was more the kind of intent of it. But I agree. I think some of those, and I think you mentioned now a couple of things, like with the pricing guardrails, with the combination therapy discounts, but maybe also with the price volume agreements, right? I mean, if you, for example, have different thresholds when a price might get down then, and maybe even backwards, because some of those could be negotiated in that way, right? Maybe physicians don't see that and might be even in a disadvantage, especially if there's maybe an audit happening. Exactly. And that's the reason why it's often said this um, no regresse because of statistical audits anymore is seen as a political escaping from responsive trial attempt to escape from responsibility mm -hmm. um, of, of physicians. But if you see the situation today, we have in the we have the price negotiation, secret rebates, payback for the initial period of time, combination discounts, furthermore, simple any kind of rebate contract for more than two thirds, almost 70% of all prescribed daily doses, um, more than 20% of the MNOC 
products have an additional rebate contract. And that's the reason why the pressure is really getting higher. Um, that we say, okay, um, we can accept that physicians have a financial or a liability for damage they really incurred. But if you do an in-label prescription for a drug with all this discounting stuff, you cannot take an economic perspective in a way to say this is cheaper or not because it's not transparent anymore. And therefore, if you prescribe off-label, okay, if there's no rebate discount, it's trade price, then physicians have to should think acceptable. But using all this contracting um, opportunities and then say, but at the end of the day, we want to do a statistic audit uh, with, a with a physician. And at the end of the day, the physician sits in front of a patient and takes a decision clinically and then has to, based on his diagnosis, to select treatments. And what else than the list price and or discount, yes, no, can the physician apply? Nothing. And that's the reason why I personally think that this discussion about regressor, at least in statistical audits, is really now the time to, to rethink this because of all the complexity that we have today. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, if, you know, from an economics perspective, I think there could have been maybe even the chance, let's say, to have a bit of a more, let's say, possibility to maneuver maybe even, let's say, the practical prescriptions on the ground based on the prices, right? Because, I mean, you had those different kind of price impacts maybe, and because of, especially in areas where um, maybe there is a bit of competition at least or different comparators and therapies available, a physician would have potentially gone even the kind of pathway what I guess some of the insurances and especially, let's say, the the the, the health system itself maybe wanted, wanted to do anyway. But I don't see that happening because physicians don't have any information, right? Exactly. And if where you see additional contracting look like group contracts like um, DEMA1, for example, uh, for dermatologists, what uh, Ersatzkassen did, okay, they collected uh, rebate contracts and the physician have a huge template of green and green and green and no real management towards certain substances exactly. or so. And still at the end of the day, what does it mean in an economic audit? They deduct 25 or 50 percent of the costs. So does it mean we have to deduct this from all products with a uh, with, with a rebate uh, contract, also outside the contract um, or not? Um, it's it's okay for the physician. They have their pro protection, their additional reimbursement, all fine. But but if you think systematically about the implication, it's again from another angle, showing that the this financial management from this good old years, 30 years ago, where once a year the water list was issued, the physician looks for the price for that year, and then they know what is expensive and what's not. So that um, we, at least from that perspective, we live in, in a new area. That's a good one, yes. But I mean, um, I could maybe even change that, let's say, hiccup, maybe call it in the system. Would you see maybe an opportunity for the industry in terms of communication of maybe the discounts to the physician? Or would you rather say, you know, it's it's nice to have, but it's maybe anyway too many information then available for the for the physicians? I think there it's of course difficult to, to communicate about the discount by itself. But um I think the communication that is agreed also with between sick funds and um and physicians, uh, sorry, sick funds and industry. Yeah. Um, even the more advanced ones stop at the level that they say, oh, then this is another economic alternative and we are not doing an individual, we will not individually sue the physician. But at mm -hmm. the end of the day, that's a bit of <laughs> not precise because we have statistical audits in all regions of Germany and legally it's not possible to sue a physician for an individual prescription if it's in label um, for economic reasons, if there's a statistical audit overall. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, the sick funds get their rebate. They write a letter which may change some prescription behavior or not, but does not really give final safety security to the physician because the statement, it's wirtschaftlich, uh, 
what does it mean? Because okay. the authorities doing the economic audit, they have a legal framework and they ask this price rebate, uh, but aggregated rebate, then it's very difficult to calculate this or to have an idea as a physician if everything was um, correctly reported by the sick fund with a rebate. It, it all stops at that level. And I think um, it should be time for the next step to say, okay, we have rebate contract. You don't have a direct economic responsibility, but we would suggest you start with this Rug A before B and C or, or whatever, and then think maybe about additional contracting with the physicians or whatever. But uh, it's, you cannot take more and more rebates in different structures and keep the economic responsibility based on the list price. Mm -hmm. That's something difficult. Yeah, no, no, that's. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Coming a bit towards the end, um, I think your hopes are clear. I think all of the discussion we just had for potential future changes, especially let's say if you're going down more from a national level, but um, which kind of changes you might even expect? I mean, we all know that the, let's say, financial situation is, let's say, maybe, maybe call it still under discussions uh, within the German healthcare system. So one could also think that there might be some further reforms happening also around AMNOC, but maybe not only necessarily, but uh, which are the changes you might potentially expect in the next maybe one to one and a half years, if any? I think um, that we will not see structural changes in, in the HDA process on mm -hmm. the GPA level, because we have the movement towards the joint clinical assessment, how to integrate with a German specific and and we in all the discussion also about this MNOC 2.0, there was never the point the benefit assessment does not work, at least not except of individual cases. Yeah? And so I do not really see a different focus in the, in the clinical assessment. I think we will have to see how the implementation of the combination rebate and so on works. And if anything happens, then it would be additional mandatory discounts or whatever to generate so short-term money. I would not expect real structural changes in the next one, two years. Yeah, I think that, that probably makes sense. And especially, I mean, we should not forget, I think we're also getting closer to the next national elections, <laughs> which is yeah, another exactly. point. <laughs> Fully agree. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Matthias, for all of your insight, not only from a national level, but this time also down to a regional, maybe even a local level. It was very good insights. So thank you again. Yes, thanks. And yeah, hope to talk again soon. Bye. Thank you. The Amnog in Germany, I think, uh, was now implemented roughly 11, 12 years ago. We're now in the year 2023 and has been now more or less already implemented. Anyhow, there have been always different kind of reforms and changes. I think some years ago there have been the very important and famous kind of change in terms of added benefit for the orphan drugs. But since January 2020, 23, there have been also now a couple of further changes, including the ones Matthias Slume has just mentioned. I think some of those have especially an impact on the national negotiation perspective. One is, for example, um, the additional discount on wastage. If there is a, a wastage in terms of packaging and distribution in a way to the patient of more than 20%, um, and then there needs to be another discount on the list price, but also others such as the combination therapy where an additional discount is being applied if the combination therapy includes the therapies which have already been assessed within the AMNOC process. Some others are obviously as well important like the price guardrails we have just mentioned dependent on the um, added benefit, then there uh, is maybe the kind of maximum price which applies, and also the price volume agreement, again, which has, let's say, new elements on a national price negotiation perspective between the industry, so the individual company, and the head association of the public health insurance funds in Germany. Nonetheless, I think the discussion today was also a bit more from a national down to regional and local level, meaning how does those kind of changes impact then the 
um, the physicians and the physician prescription behaviors and or also, for example, the kind of work of the regional payers, for example, on the economic audit. As you have heard, there has not yet been really any kind of clear directions for the regional and local levels, but this might maybe come later in 2023 and or the latest in 2024. I think we have just heard uh, we're still in summer 23 um, that the GBA has just issued new rules and regulations on the combination therapies. So let's stay tuned and see what kind of changes might further happen, not only in Germany, but also in other jurisdictions of the world. That was an episode of MAP, the market access podcast provided by Mars Market Access and Pricing Strategy, which is your healthcare consultancy in the German-speaking markets. MAP is available every second week with a new episode, so watch out. And in case you might have questions, contact me directly and or visit our website on www.marketaccess-pricingstrategy.de.